This episode of Sassler Something is brought to you by Slim Jim. So I want to start this one with a story. Uh, when I was younger and I was living in San Francisco, back in the tech TV days, um, there was a super special concert that was performing at a local kind of music place called Bottom of the Hill. And everyone started to think that it was the Beastie Boys because they had done this one time before. This is when the Beastie Boys were truly at the height. And they were like the gods for old people like me. Well, I wasn't old back then. Anyway, that's not the point. Anyway, everyone starts thinking that the Beastie Boys are going to be playing. And people are trying to get in. They're getting their tickets. They're getting excited. And it's really, really crowded at the club. It turns out it's not the Beastie Boys. It was the band Cake. And I always thought to myself, what was it like for that band? Well, I'm not saying they were good or bad, and they were not the Beastie Boys, knowing that they're going to walk out on that stage and they're going to disappoint everybody. The reason I'm telling this story is that's why I'm relatively confident that Sony will be revealing a brand new console at this event that is happening in New York City on the 20th. I just don't understand why a company would drum out that much hype when everyone's pretty certain that they have a new product and then talk about something else. But who knows? There's only time can tell. Regardless, that leads me to discussing that we are finally looking at what will be the year of new consoles. I, have, I also find it very hard to believe that if Sony is going to bring something out this year, that Microsoft will not respond. Because one of the major reasons that the 360 was so successful during this period, especially in the United States, was that it had a whole year's jump on the PlayStation 3. And of course, in the previous generation, the PlayStation 2 really was assisted by having a year jump on the competition. That's not the most important thing. It also is the games and the services and all that stuff. But let's just say availability in a vacuum really does make a difference. So what does this mean? Well, this means that we can finally reinvigorate what I think many people are starting to feel like is, if not a morbid game industry, one that really could use a little sense of excitement. Um, yeah, there's been some great games that have been coming out in the past years, but we have also been seeing a lot of rehashing of familiar ideas. And while those games in the instance can be quite enjoyable, you don't get the sense that the industry itself is terribly uh, sort of excited, is becoming experimental, is doing something to help redefine what it can do and what games can actually be. When you have new technology like this, it kind of wipes the deck and it gets people excited. Now, um, there is still some questions out there. I don't expect either of the consoles to uh, be cheap. I expect them maybe to have multiple SKUs that could adjust sort of the, the, the hard drive and what you can actually do with the console. But I think for people that are sitting here listening to me yammer, we're looking at probably a fairly expensive console. Um, that means it, it may not install itself into a lot of homes like kind of say what the Wii did in, the, in this generation, but at the same time, I like the idea that if it is expensive, you're gonna get enough with it that it can do a wide variety of things and will be able to allow for a lot of innovation and creativity going forward. Now, this seems to always be bringing out that, those, those articles written by people going, oh, the game industry's in trouble, Sony announces this, but it's a new world with mobile. And, and mobile games and the stuff you can play on your iPad, everything's changed, everything is doomed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting so tired of hearing that. Uh, I actually think a very good sign uh, for what's gonna happen with these two consoles is that the Wii U is uh, not doing as well. Nintendo had to revise down their numbers of how many Wii U's are going to be sold. Um, early adopters tend to be very well attuned to what's happening in the industry and I imagine a large chunk of those Wii U owners and people who were thinking about buying a Wii U were aware that there was a Sony and Microsoft system somewhere down the line. I think the soft sales on the Wii U, outside of the fact that it could use some software, um, are because people want to wait and see. They want to see what the offerings are going to be before they make that investment of $350 plus dollars on a system and the games that it's going to have. So I actually think that there is a positive that you can read into the Nintendo sales. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to hear what can be done with games. As someone who's covered this for so long, I love this part of it because A, it becomes a parlor game trying to guess what it all means, and B, uh, it gives me something to talk about. I mean, I'm always talking about something, but yeah, I, I, I really do find that, that I, I think this is going to be a year when a lot of my, myself and my colleagues, we can get a little bit caustic from time to time when we start to embrace the, the incredible feeling that comes from this job. All right, our question this week comes from Johnny Two, but he has two J's. Maybe that's why there's a two at the end of his name. Who knows, maybe Johnny will let us know. This is his question, short, sweet, and to the point. 
I want to hear Adam's opinion on the Dead Space 3 microtransactions. All right. Here are my feelings on the Dead Space 3 microtransactions. I don't care. Uh, it is not an essential aspect of the game. I do not expect any time in the future that we will see uh, microtransactions in a game that are essential for completing the game, playing the game. Uh, I think microtransactions are there for people that maybe are adults. They don't have all the time in the world to play a game and would like to speed themselves along a little bit. And I think it's fully within EA's rights to do that. That doesn't break, that doesn't unbalance the game, especially when it's just single player, or say in this case, also it allows for two-person co-op. I think that's a very reasonable thing to do as well within EA's rights to do that. I think a lot of the fear and the hoopla is coming from the fact that people so love to hate EA that if EA said that they were offering gold, you're like, well, yeah, but you can get poison from it. It's EA. Origin is going to sneak inside and take my children. Um, look, I have a huge number of issues with how EA has handled things in the past, but this kind of hyperventilated paranoia that's surrounding uh, the idea that anything they do is odious and malevolent is hysterical to the point that it doesn't, it's not even worth paying attention to it. Um, there, there are business decisions they've done that I think are good. There are ones that I think that are bad. I think the DRM issue is one that is still worthy of discussion. Uh, but when it comes to microtransactions, that is a way to generate more money, which needs to happen for a lot of companies. I mean, it is kind of like the music industry. They need to find new sources of revenue so that they can keep their bottom line good so they can make more games so that you can play them. So uh, I would just encourage all of you to kind of take a deep breath. You don't want to buy stuff in the game? Don't buy stuff in the game. You think uh, the guy who's doing it's kind of a, a loser? I mean, you can go tell him that, but you'll look like a douche doing it. On the topic of Dead Space 3, our review is coming out Tuesday, the 5th of February. That's tomorrow, if today is Monday for you, and it's yesterday, if today is Wednesday for you, and it's right now, if it's Tuesday. So uh, go check it out. Uh, there's more to it than just microtransactions. So uh, you'll see if we like it, or if we don't, then then 